does not matter. Okay. Oh, gosh. Um, hi, um, I'm Melissa Cermak. I'm with the Access Center at MSU Denver. I'm the assistant director, one of the assistant directors there. And I'll let Jan introduce herself and then we can talk a little bit about services because they're pretty similar. Hi, my name is Jan Murray and I'm accessibility specialist <laughs> at the Community College of Denver. And one thing I'd just like to say to you all is that Melissa and I work together. There's three campuses down at the Auraria um, campus. So it's pretty wonderful. We do have a lot of the same services. We do sometimes service different types of students. And we'll explain that a little bit. Hopefully most of you are familiar with Metropolitan State University of Denver. We are a bachelor's and master's um, degree conferring institutions. Um, the Access Center is the office on campus that serves students with disabilities. So we're typically working with students who might have been on an IEP during high school. Um, maybe they were on a 504 plan and receiving accommodations. And then we ob obviously have a population of students um, we're a pretty diverse campus like CCD. Um, I think the average class or average age is about age 25. So we pull in a lot of non-traditional students. So we see some students as well who may not have used services in K through 12 or haven't been in the K through 12 setting for a very long time when maybe um, certain services weren't available um, and those kinds of things. Um, our office is serving about 1300 students um, with disabilities. Um, and the vast majority of them, um, well, we say is 99% of them um, have non-apparent disabilities. So our main populations are students um, who would have learning disabilities or learning differences. We see a lot of ADHD, ADD. Uh, we see a lot of mental health. That's a growing uh, population. Students with bipolar, depression, anxiety, PTSD. Those are probably the major um, mental health. We see a growing number of students on the autism spectrum, and I can talk a little bit about some things I'm hearing down the pipeline regarding students on the spectrum. Um, and then a lot of students with um, physical systemic illnesses. So we may be working with students with diabetes, um, other medical conditions, seizure disorders. I see a lot of those as well. Um, in terms of our students, outside of kind of those non-apparent disabilities, uh, we've had a growing population of students who are blind or significant low vision. Uh, so we are roughly are around eight to 10 students. And I can talk a little bit of model, about a model we use for those students. Uh, we have about, I think, three students right now who do interpreting services who are deaf or significantly hard of hearing and use interpreting services. Um, and then I think we probably have about uh, 15 to 20 students uh, who are using mobility devices. And that's been kind of a thing for the fall is kind of where some of those scooters go in spaces and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the population we serve. Maybe we can just kind of go back and forth. Sure. And I don't know if you sure. have anything to add. So a little bit of a difference that would be with the community <laughs> colleges, we are part of 13 colleges and our colleges um, have associate degrees and certificates. And so a student that would be coming to the community college of Denver might be a DPS student or a Cherry Creek student or any of the high schools in the area or a transfer student. Melissa alluded to that we do have a different type of population. Um, I do have a lot of vets, a lot of mental health, a lot a lot of returning students who might have been out in the workforce and decided they wanted to come back in and they were not diagnosed with any type of disability when they were in high school but yet they'll say things like well I had an aide helping me but I didn't have a 504 and I didn't have an IEP so then we have to figure out how we're going to um, accommodate the student or can we get the documentation to help them. We have a lot of students that are dealing with mental health. Mental health is definitely one of the largest things that we see and being down in Denver we are seeing a lot of it. We do have students that are homeless and we do have students that are coming from all these really incredibly different types of backgrounds and I think you guys could probably imagine what a city college would be like on that type of campus that we've been talking about. Um, we are much smaller. We service of over 300 students 
with not all of them receiving accommodations and not all of them going through college all at the same time. Some of them might stop for a semester and work, help a family out, you know, deal with whatever situations could be a health situation also and then come back. Um, the certificate programs are kind of um, not all located at the community college at Denver in the um, city part. We have Lari campus and we also have advanced manufacturing um, business that's outside of the campus area, but they are great certificate programs and a lot of students are really looking to use those. So I'll let Melissa pick up here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one of the biggest differences and Jan does a transition course and she can talk a little bit about that and I do a lot of outreach to uh, different area high schools during college nights or any of their kind of programming for particularly juniors and seniors. Um, and one of the biggest points of difference when we're talking about services at the post-secondary level is kind of how you access services. Because when we're in the K-12 setting, we talk with students about how they're typically already identified. They're typically working with a case manager or a support team in the schools. They're having those regular IEP meetings or 504 plan meetings. And so a lot of what's happening with the student is kind of happening without them really driving um, the car. Um, and when we get to the college level, um, we're working with adult learners. And so one of the biggest things that we try to stress with students is, is at the college level, they need to seek out services and self-disclose that they have a disability. Um, that's gonna be one of the biggest differences. And so there's not gonna be any place on the college application that says check here if you need accommodations or you're a student with a disability. Um, they actually need to kind of seek out our services, um, find our office, and then come through what we consider an interactive process. And Jan can talk about their process. Um, what we have students do is do an accommodations eligibility appointment. Um, we like to see students, if they're making that transition from high school to college, we're open all summer. I, that's what I tell everyone, all summer long, um, because we know that the first couple weeks of the semester are gonna be crazy busy in our office. And that's when we get the students that are like crying at our front desk, like, I need my accommodations. And it's like, we were here all summer, right? <laughs> So we're there all summer um, to meet with students, to start to work with them on identifying what their needs are. Um, our process includes having them bring some form of documentation. So it could be that IEP, it could be that 504 plan, it could be any sort of assessments they've gone through, psychoed assessments, um, medical kind of assessments. We see lots of different versions of documentation um, and we take that and that is just a part of the process. Um, but generally we're having a conversation with the student regarding their learning needs. So we talk a little bit about the factors that um, can influence success in school. Where are they gonna be living? Are they commuting to campus? Will they be working? Do they have an employer that's pretty flexible with hours? We talk a little bit about their use of technology and if they've already been using um, access technology um, and if so, what that has been for them. And then we do a full assessment of just kind of their learning needs. So we talk about everything from how do you do paying attention? How do you do uh, taking useful notes in a class? How would you do taking an exam? Um, how do you do, does, is attendance ever an issue for you? And we're using all of that from the students um, to figure out uh, what would be appropriate accommodations. And we do like a light health and wellness kind of assessment. So how do they handle stress? Are they working with therapists? Those kinds of things. This is like flashing, does that matter? Okay. I'm assuming I have to hold it down. So, um, uh, so we take all that information, um, determine what accommodations we're gonna be able to provide. Uh, part of that might be also talking about technology and that's the other part of our office is that we have an accessible technology specialist on staff. Uh, that works with students regarding particular access technologies um, and getting students connected with her. Um, if they haven't used technology, having her kind of assess what their needs might be um, and going from there. And so in the summer, the student can actually have a pretty good sense of what accommodations are gonna be approved as they start those fall classes. And at the college level, again, it's all that self-advocacy piece and the student owning their learning. So they're gonna get that letter and for us, they're the ones that give that to the professors. So we really stress 
professors aren't going to know what your disability is, but they're going to know that you're approved for accommodations through our office, and it's your responsibility to give those letters to your faculty and inform them. If they do not give a letter, the professor has no legal obligation to provide accommodations until that happens. Um, and so uh, that's generally where we're kind of working with students during that kind of getting ready stage to kind of get them going. Um, get them ready. Um, I work with a lot of my first year incoming students on if I see them in the summer, I'm not going to tell them about how, how to schedule an exam. That's a little overwhelming and they don't need to know that information until the year starts. So I usually recheck in with my first year students about a week before the semester starts just to say, what are we nervous about? Is there anything I can help you with in terms of navigating college? Because transition to college is a huge issue whether you're Oh, there we go. There I talk too much. Um, <laughs> and then we're <laughs> and then we're visiting um, possibly a week or two into the year just to see how was that process of giving the letter to the professor? Were there any questions or concerns that professor had or they had after that discussion? And then from there, we might determine how much they want to work with our office. They do not need um, and are they are not kind of forced to meet with their accessibility coordinators. So that's an important part of it. Um, but I've seen that students who engage a little bit more regularly on the front end, I feel like tend to be a little more successful because they have that foundation, they have a place to ask questions um, that come up for them and then we're able to kind of address just regular college transition issues. Right now we're having a lot of conversations about how do you register for classes, which involves a lot of tasks, checking if you, when your date is for registration, if you have any holds on your account, who the heck your advisor is, which like 80% of students don't know who that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to get them through those steps that they need. Talk about their process. So the things that Melissa <laughs> just mentioned are very similar at the community college of Denver. The whole process that she just talked about, about students having to come forward and, and do advocation for themselves is exactly what high schoolers need to be you know, considering. Um, if they don't do that, then there's no way that the teachers will ever know that they need accommodations. So that is one of the largest things that um, <laughs> I've been working on. I am actually working with another person um, in Melissa's office, um, and we are doing a combination class together of Metro State, Community College at Denver, DPS schools, and also Cherry Creek to do a transition class for juniors and se seniors. And um, we're doing it on Wednesday evenings from 4.30 to 6.30, and it's a 13-week class, and it covers a lot of ideas about what students could um, possibly learn before they go to college. And it could be a lot of the things that Melissa just discussed that goes on in our process, like filling out forms, um, how to advocate for yourselves, assistive technology. We do a teacher's panel. We do a student panel. We do an orientation. We do uh, um, visitation of what the campus looks like. We also do things about talking about the difference of what it was like in high school and how you used your accommodation and now what it's like in college and what you could expect and how to use your accommodation. There could be some accommodations that you received in high school that will not be allowed in college. And one of those, and then just kind of a word that helps us when we're looking at an IEP or a 504 is the word modification. If a student has had um, the testing ability of just taking, I'm just making this up, instead of um, 20 questions on a test to just take half of it, or if they were only having to do a portion of a paper or a portion of an assignment, that's not gonna happen in college. That's not gonna happen at the community college. It's not gonna happen at Metro. It's, it's probably not gonna happen. So um, those are important things to make sure that these students are aware of. And so sometimes we have to talk about that in our intakes and try to help them understand. So going back to this transition class that we've been doing, it has been going on for quite a while. I have only been a part of it for maybe six semesters. And what has happened is, is it has grown and it has become something that students are really thankful for. I have six students right now that were part of 
one of the classes at one time or another um, that are still going forward. And there's many more. They don't have to go to Metro or the Community College of Denver. They could go to any college. This is just to help them learn about what the college could be. So I am getting a blinking light too. <laughs> Let it go. And Let it go. It's telling me it's time to be done. <laughs> but um, I don't, I mean, Melissa and I, I think we're trying to explain our programs pretty well and what we do. But I would love it if you guys could ask us some questions. Does that sound like about the right time? And and really, a lot of the things that <laughs> Melissa spoke of are very similar. You know, really, the difference is, is that, you know, we're a community college. And so there's a lot of things that we might not have um, that a four-year college may have. And those could be, you know, examples of a rec center or sports teams or maybe a um, a three-pronged writing center and we might only have two or, you know, th things like that. And so I think you have to look at each school as an individual situation and does it fit the individual student coming to that school. So I, I really feel like we have a lot of similarities. So questions? Could you say your name and where you're from? Sure. Uh, Paul Visvader from uh, BVSD. And for students who didn't have an IEP or 504, what types of assessments do you use to determine? So we don't do any testing at CCD or Metro, but we can help them refer out to find what they might need. If it's a student that might need a psychological evaluation, we do have the possibility <laughs> of offering them, if they're part of our community of the three colleges there, to go to CU Denver to have a psychological evaluation for a lot cheaper than they would if they went out in the private sector. Um, another thing that they could do is use the health services at Metro, and I'm going to let Melissa speak to that. To get back in terms of um, your question of what kinds of assessment, um, the answer always in accessibility services is it depends. Um, it depends really on what the students presenting concerns are. We work uh, really closely with the, um, Auraria, the health center at Auraria, which is our health center on campus, and a lot of students will present there with, it could be a mental health issue, it could be that they um, have always struggled with executive functioning and attentional issues, and that might be the first time that they're working with a physician regarding a possible ADD, ADHD diagnosis. Uh, we work really closely with our counseling center as well, and they're often working with students, and students might present there, or based on what we're hearing from a student, we might say you might want to consider the counseling center on campus as a uh, source of getting some documentation. We try to work, and I think Jan would say that with CCD as well, we're always trying to work with students in terms of what they do have. Um, so like I said, I've seen audiology reports. I have no idea what they mean, but if the student can articulate how they're having a hearing issue, works for me, right? Because it's that interactive process. Um, what I would say is that I think it's really important as you're working with students on the transition that they're having conversations with the, the environment they're considering transitioning into. Because uh, I think Jan and I would agree that uh, Community College of Denver and Metro are pretty lenient when it comes to documentation. What I would say is not all colleges are lenient and some of them are a little bit more firm on what they're looking for when it comes to specific documentation, the age of the documentation. This was a big thing when I started at Metro maybe seven years ago where it used to be that our documentation guidelines included the documentation must be within the last three years or five years or seven years, right? And there was a little shift in terms of um, accessibility services, I think, to some degree, um, based on AHEAD, which is the Association for Higher Education and Disability, where they were saying, sometimes it seems like accessibility service offices are the biggest barriers to students getting the need supports they need. Because you had all these students, right, um, who may not have had really recent documentation um, of disabilities that were definitely evident, um, don't change over time, right? Typically, a student with autism um, 
doesn't stop being a student with autism, the same with a student with dyslexia doesn't stop being a student with dyslexia. But for whatever reason, they were getting to the college level and being asked, like, can you produce some documentation? Some, can you get reassessed? Um, and what a head said was, you're the barrier. So a lot of people kind of reevaluated that. And I would say Community College of Denver and Metro, many of our um, kind of companion schools in Colorado and Wyoming have adopted the AHEAD guidelines to be a little bit more willing of like, if you can provide us with some information, um, we believe that we have some clinical expertise to take whatever that information is and in that interactive process, figure out how we might best serve you without it being too much of a burden on the student. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> You guys provide tutors? Tutoring is considered a personal service. And I think that that's probably an important area to discuss because maybe many of your students might be using personal services and might be thinking that that's going to exist at the college level. Um, MSU Denver has a full tutoring center. It's free for all students to use. Um, so they can use that as much or as little as they want. Uh, we have a writing center that has multiple locations. And in fact, we have writing center tutors in the access center twice a week for students to work with, um, particularly on writing skills. Uh, the math department has a math support lab and some of the other departments have some resources for students as well. So tutoring is not considered an accommodation at the collegiate level. Um, it's considered a support service that anyone has access to. So we don't provide any additional tutoring. It's not an accommodation. The other area this comes up is personal aids. Um, so students who may need an aid, we've had aids that assist with su uh, suctioning and all variety of medical things, uh, the student needs to have and hire their own personal aid. And that's the same with you guys, right? I uh, think she says the same. Yeah. Uh, where we might see a little difference is lab assistance. Um, our office um, does work with certain students on lab assistance in science classes in particular. Um, and we have a student right now who's taking um, a math an algebra class and I'm, I've got a lab assistant for him, which was a little weird, but it's called a math lab. And they do a lot of working problems and he's a quadriplegic. So for him, he has a process at home that he uses when he does his homework. And we provide a scribe when he takes his test to handwrite, but typically in a lab setting to work problems, that's gonna be difficult. So we're using one of our student employees to attend the class to with him and just basically be his hands. I've heard that that might be a little bit more tutoring right now because the student who's working with him was like, I can't scribe his exam because I feel like I might actually try to help him on it. And I was like, well, thanks for letting me know. Um, so, and we've done that as well for um, mostly for students who are blind or who have mobility issues in lab settings to have just someone be their hands or be their eyes in that setting. I'm going to test my microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, of course, I, I'm Gloria and I'm with the Colorado Department of Education and I'm in the K-12 system and I am a senior consultant in secondary transition. So I wanted to um, just kind of from the our side, the guidance we give uh, as we do professional development to high school special education teachers is really exactly what you're saying. So that's good news. Uh, we really encourage, because we always get questions, how old does the do the exams or the evaluations have to be? What kind of testing do they want? And we really um, stress the importance of going to the school where the student thinks they're going to go to get that information because it does vary. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we do encourage our high school special education teachers to think about when they're writing IEPs at the high school level uh, is to really think about fading those accommodations um, and eliminating modifications as, as possible by giving students the strategies they need to be able to do those tasks uh, and learn the strategies. Um, because <clears throat> what we find in K-12 special education is sometimes an overabundance of willingness to help um, and provide, you know, 20 accommodations and um, 
we know that's not realistic once they take that step into the adult world. So um, that is one of the one of the ideas when we talk about the continuum of services for transition age youth, those that are going to post-secondary education, really watching, uh, well, actually even into the work world, it's the same thing, cutting back on those accommodations, providing strategies for students to be successful and to advocate for themselves. So I just wanted to jump in for that. Piggyback on that. One of the main things that people have to think about with the transition is um, you can determine whether something is an accommodation or a modification by looking at whether it fundamentally alters the course right. um, or the requirements for the course. So that's a really important discussion of can a student use notes? Well, that's on an exam that is considered a fundamental alteration of the testing experience and what the professor might be going for. So that's one of the things that we're often talking about is are we fundamentally altering a requirement of the course? Yeah. And another thing I thought about when you were talking was in high school, when these students are still in high school in their sophomore year, uh, at least in their sophomore year, if they are thinking of a post-secondary education um, future when they get out of high school, to really um, get some realistic conversations going with the parents and families, uh, because a lot of times that can be a barrier uh, going forward um, for those students, um, is really their parents' understanding of what happens when they leave that public education K-12 system and go into those adult agencies, services, schools, whatever. This is, a this is a tiny bit different, but I've had students come to me after being at the Community College of Denver for a year or two, a couple semesters, and say, I thought my accommodations were just going to follow me from right. 12 to the college level. And as you can tell, that is not the case. And so they might not have done as well and then realize that, you know, the accommodations that they did receive in high school could possibly help them also. So I have that happen more times than not. And I, I also think that some students want to come forward from high school and maybe try it on their own and, and see how they can do. And, and, and maybe they do okay, but sometimes they don't. Right. <laughs> and, I end up kind of seeing them afterwards. And it is um, it, it is disappointing that they didn't understand, but I think a lot of them are trying to spread their wings and try to see what they can do. So I can't really fault them for that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the um, realities of the differences between high school and college that isn't talked about a lot, um, but I did uh, have a presentation by Northeastern junior college um, disability services person. And they have a really cool handout that they give that really delineates a lot more information on the differences between the two settings than I have seen by any other organization yet. And one of the things I talk about is the um, length of time to do the work in that you're in the post-secondary, your semesters or your quarters or whatever you go by, are very short. So a student who's trying to go it on their own, it doesn't take very long before it's too late for them to get the help they need. So I think just that idea of, you know, in high school, things get dragged out, you get extra time for this, extra time for assignments. Well, there really isn't a lot of extra time in, in college for that, that kind of a um, allowance. So I think that's just a, another Thing to build into the high school students early on, um, not to get a false sense of, yes, you can go on and on with these assignments or tests. And I'd be happy to share that document from Northeastern Junior College with anybody who wants it. I can send it to someone. You could send it to me, Gloria, and I can make sure that I push it out to the group. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, she's the uh, gal said I could forward it on, so it's it's uh, pretty good. Super. So um, I have a question. I'm just wondering if you could speak to us a little bit about 
um, transitioning technologies, um, the, the kinds of assistive technologies that are frequently used in the schools. Do you find that there's a similarity or, or that those technologies transfer over into a higher education environment? Are there recommendations or strategies for our assistive tech folks in the schools to better prepare students for the kinds of technologies that they're gonna be required to use in higher ed? So I guess I would ask that question back because I don't know what kind, uh, because as you know, Colorado, each, each school is going to have their own limitations of resources and that goes to assistive technology as well. So I think that one of those early questions when students are freshmen, sophomores, considering post-secondary, where they're headed, is it a community college, a four-year college, and trying to get a feel for what's out there at that time, number one, because it changes so fast. Um, and just like colleges, high schools have different um, technology. So I, there is not one standard recommended technology that goes out statewide from the state. Um, it's really all determined at the school level. But I do think that it's, it would be nice if there were like some standard things in the post-secondary setting that could be pushed down to the high school level so that students would have an opportunity to learn how to use it and become proficient in when it works for them and how to use it before they transfer to the post-secondary setting but just give them a little bit of a leg up on that. I don't know if that's even possible though. Well, I'll piggyback on that in terms of, I do think that um, if you look at the literature, I think one of the things is that there's a huge discrepancy when it comes to uh, learning-based kind of assistive technology and it's not widely used in the high schools. sometimes when we're talking about more text-to-speech, those kinds of things, we're often seeing students who are introduced to that in college um, and that is late in the game because now right. you're transitioning, um, you're trying to manage your college experience, right. and you're learning a technology that could be a really beneficial tool, um, but you're having to do that in the midst of every other pressure that you have. Mm -hmm. um, most college campuses do typically have some technology that would be text-to-speech based. So um, MSU Denver, we are a read and write um, campus. So we use read and write, which is a product of text help. Um, and it has full uh, text to speech capabilities on it. Uh, so students can use that. It reads content to them, whether that's from a website, uh, whether it's from a, a book that we might produce in electronic format, which are, is an accommodation and it's something that we provide as alternative format text materials. Um, and so, and it's got some great writing tools. It's got some of those planning tools for writing. I'm not as familiar with some of them, um, but some really great tools to be able to highlight um, books that they're reading, extract those highlights into a notes page. So I usually talk about it as an academic efficiency tool. Mm -hmm. um, Ann can talk about how they use it at CCD, but we're licensed for the whole campus to use Read and Write, which means that students who are registered with our office who might need accessible text materials and for us to get the books so that they can use Read and Write to read those textbooks, they do need to be registered to get the textbooks. But any student can use Read and Write. It's part of our Blackboard learning management system. Students can go in and download either a Mac or PC version, and they can work with our office if they run into any issues with that. So we do a lot during new student orientation to the whole orient, like new first year students to say, we're a Read and Write campus. We encourage you to use Read and Write. It's here, it's free. You should put it on your device because it's about a $300 software that we're allowing you to access. Um, and we have a Chrome version as well. So I know a Chrome plugin exists. So I know my kids are in Douglas County schools. They're often carrying Chromebooks around. Uh, so that would be something for folks to look into is text help. Um, their read and write product. Other schools might use Kurzweil or some of the other softwares mm -hmm. out there. Um, right. We also then, outside of kind of that support, we do have kind of what we call ADA accessible kind of 
stations in our computer labs on campus that might have full scanning and JAWS and those kinds of things. Um, so that's there, but we also, any student could use Zoom text on a computer, they can use JAWS. Um, Dragon is a tricky one. Speech to text is just something that's really um, a difficult thing to put in a computer lab because you can't put multiple people in a computer right. lab using Dragon. We learned that with a transition course when I used to do it a long time ago. Put six people in the room, try to teach them Dragon and watch Dragon like go crazy, right? right. right. You don't know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Um, so Dragon hasn't been something that's really, if we have students who are using it, they're typically purchasing those licenses on their own. Um, we do have it in our testing computers. So if a student needed to use Dragon where we can close a door and they can use it in an office, they can do that. Um, we do a lot with apps because right now students don't have a lot of um, money for things and there's a lot of great apps out there. Um, notability, lots of note-taking apps that are wonderful. Um, we're actually doing a pilot this semester. Uh, um, okay, so uh, there's a company called Sonascent. Um, you can check them out. It's S-O-N-O, S-O-N-O-C-E-N-T. Um, they're a British company and their um, product is for, I wouldn't say it's quite note-taking. Um, it's kind of a note-taking review process. So the student um, can bring a laptop or their phone, but it works best on a laptop. They can upload the PowerPoints for that presentation that day, and then they hit record. And what the software does is it has a box where it's recording everything the professor is saying. It does not transcribe it unless you're a Dragon user and have that. It will do it if you have Dragon. Um, but it actually just bars the sound, right? So the student, the idea is, is they can designate, if the professor says, you really need to know this for the exam, they can hit a button on their laptop and it'll change the color of those bars to say that's important content. Mm -hmm. Or if the professor decided to talk about his vacation, they can say not important, right? And the idea that Sonocent is trying to promote is that a student can then go back, listen to the content, they can clean up and delete parts of the audio that aren't important. They can take notes and then it's all in one location. So we've been doing a, um, we've been doing a pilot. Uh, CU Denver uses Sonascent. They did the pilot and went ahead and um, decided to purchase it. We don't know where we're at with that. Uh, one of the comments that I've heard from students is, I think this is like a gateway drug to Dragon. Because <laughs> what they want is, they don't want it just to give them the recording. They want it to transcribe it. Right. And that's where Dragon comes in and makes it a little bit more powerful. So and I'm like, it's not going to happen. We're not going to get you Dragon. Um, but that's that's been a new software. Um, and many schools do um, use smart pens. I think CCD mm -hmm. might can do that. We don't get into the smart pen business because that's like just you might as well give people $100 and tell them to take your money. Like. <laughs> So we have a program, a, a loaning program for smart pens, and I'm not sure we'll stay in the business, as Melissa put it, but what we do is we allow students to try audio recording, and do you all know what a smart pen is, and you all use it maybe with your students? So um, a lot of students that we met, or do meet, you know, might not have access to it, so we allow a semester of them trying it. And we train them, and we also use YouTube videos to do some of that job. Um, we find that a lot of students will go out and purchase this afterwards. You know, we haven't talked about voc rehab much, but some of our students come from voc rehab, and sometimes some of these tools that we're talking about are things that they can receive also through <coughs> I find that the smart pen really does work for students that are note takers and not having computers in the classroom. It does really serve a great purpose. Um, I have tried to use it a few times and found out how difficult it is to use if I sit in the second row or hear, or hear my own paper chattering, moving around. Um, but I do think it does work for a lot of students. And so we do have that program going on right now. We probably have about 20 to 25 smart pens that we load out every semester. I'm not sure once all these pens um, no longer work that we're going to keep going with the program. Um, it's a lot of work to uh, maintain. 
<laughs> so, but one other piece that the audio recording of using your cell phone or your apps in the classroom, that is actually an accommodation. And we try to help students use that. And taking pictures too. Yep, and taking pictures of a whiteboard or a chalkboard or any material that could be on a PowerPoint. So those are accommodations that might be different than what's been being used in the high school. Um, but I do find that if they are using audio recorder as opposed to um, like an <laughs> iPhone, I mean, that can work too. So we have some students that are like low tech that want to have audio recording. And I find that this does really work for them. I did come across, I'm just gonna tell you this as kind of an FYI. I came across a radiology teacher out at our Lori campus that um, was videoing herself. So it was captioned, it was videoed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was recorded. And so the student didn't have to do anything. I was just like so amazed. So, you know, there are some teachers that are taking upon themselves to do more and more for all students. And that was just one example that I just had to throw in because I was really surprised. <laughs> um, one other thing I would like to say is that we still do have a volunteer note taker program. Um, it is successful, but there are moments that it is not successful. So if your students had been receiving notes on a regular basis, we try to keep that going the best that we can. Um, let's just bring up some of the possibilities though, like a student could, um, that's a note taker might not come to class. So then maybe there wouldn't be notes available unless there was somebody else that took the notes. I mean, there's things that can happen to make the note taking program not work as well. Um, but it is something that we still are providing. The teachers also are providing PowerPoints and teacher notes available to the students by email. And one thing Melissa um, did touch upon, but I just kind of like to bring it up is that each of our colleges have data management systems. They have Blackboard and we have D2L and that's something students need to learn to use. And so hopefully your high schools have something like that. So they're at least familiar with doing emails and Dropboxing assignments. Those are all things that really would be helpful once they get to college thing just about that is um, making sure that they're using the technology they have. Um, I know I have a sophomore and he barely checks his email. Um, and so it's um, a really important lesson that like, yes, texting is fun, um, but the rest of the world in professional communications and in particularly post-secondary um, college kind of environments, uh, we expect that students are checking their email. And I try to stress that to students. If you're not checking it twice a day, um, then you should be. So <laughs> that should be the real, like that is a, a big point of, um, of that. And, and piggybacking off of what Jan said is, everything has moved online. So you don't go in and talk to an advisor and then they sign you up for the classes. You go in, you talk to an advisor, they give you suggestions, and you go home and you sign up online. So students have to navigate multiple systems, and so it's good for them to be as comfortable as they can and have some experiences with all of the different um, tools. And that includes also just we see a lot more faculty that are using um, third-party like publisher instructional materials. So if you're familiar with like the Pearson products, like my stat lab, my anything, like my bio, mastering bio, um, they're a little bit of an accessibility nightmare, but they're the reality of education in America today is that a lot of students are going to class and then are expected to do a lot of learning in these online platforms. And where our offices get involved is when those are not accessible um, due to a student's disability. And then it's not really a fun discussion, uh, but we're the ones who have to have those difficult discussions about ac access for all students. Mm -hmm. I'll ask one last question. So what types of accommodations are typically off the table? When I, when I use the word modifications, that's usually under that category. I'm not sure that you're hearing me. Are you hearing me? Okay. Um, 
that's usually the area that is off the table. <laughs> and, and I gave the example of the chapter books or possibility of giving a lesser assignment or a lesser test. That is not going to happen. What we can do, though, is if a student is taking a math test, we can what we call chunking the test and maybe do it in two parts. Um, it just depends on what the student's disability was and what they are used to. But let's just use this as an example. Let's say the math test has a, um, a true and false section and then maybe a, um, a B, C, D, you know, type or all. So maybe they could take those in two different places. I mean, just that is one idea to help in that area. Don't know if that's the same thing Metro does, but I do know that we will do that. We also have um, our math department has decided to go forward with a formula sheet, which is to help students with the memorizing a formula. And it's not necessarily like a, a note page or a cheat sheet, as it might be called. It's a formula page. And so it's like a processing. It's helping them not with actually doing the <laughs> problem, but mem you know, helping them so they don't have to memorize all the formulas. And our math department has been allowing that for a lot of the beginning classes. I know it does cause trouble in the sense when they start getting to some of the higher, higher classes because it might not be allowed. But we talk about it upfront with them that this is something to try to help them get through this, um, but it's not necessarily what Metro's gonna do. So I'm gonna let to say overall the answer is always it depends and what we're seeing a little bit more from uh, legal cases in this area is that the biggest thing is whether or not you've had an interactive process and that no one can say we don't do that um, that's become the big lesson from all of the lawsuits that we see particularly in the post-secondary level is the student comes in and says I want this accommodation and everyone says well we don't do that um, that's gonna get you in trouble. So now we have to kind of explore what is it exactly that the student is requesting. So in the past, I would have said, student comes in and says, I want to be able to use notes on an exam. I would have said, nope, that we don't do that, right? Um, but we're actually in the process, and we were talking about it driving over here, of looking at the use of memory aids and if a student was to make that request, what becomes the process? And ultimately the question at hand um, that we're seeing other institutions asking is, asking faculty basically, is recall and memory a fundamental aspect of the course and of this uh, test? So we're gonna anticipate 95% of faculty who want students to recall information without any prompts are gonna say, yep, that's important, right? Um, and so once they've answered that, then we are gonna have to say, then that's a fundamental part of the course. If the faculty says, well, you know, it's probably okay, you know, they don't really need to be able to recall these formulas in real life right off the bat. They could always use something. That's gonna open the door then for a discussion about what kinds of notes or recall aids we provide. Um, and like I said, it's a very, it's very in the works. We just discussed it last week at a team meeting. I've seen like our proposal and it's going to include quite a process in terms of if notes would be used, we're going to have to have the student produce notes, the notes that they want to use like five days in advance. They're going to need to be reviewed by the faculty member um, and edited for content that the faculty member feels like can't be used on there. Um, and it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth. So I saw it and went, oh, this could be a mess. Um, but, but like I said, I think we're always trying to engage on is it an interactive process and are we advocating for students. The other thing I see sometimes is just some ones that I don't even think of as accommodations and that would be like, student can use advanced organizers or um, we see some that are like writing out like organizers for papers. Um, that's not gonna be an accommodation. The student's gonna wanna work with the writing center or whatever strategies they have um, to do those things. So that's where I sometimes see where it feels like it's more instructional strategies that shouldn't be on the accommodations in the first place on the IEP. Those should be some of the skills we're teaching students to be mm -hmm. successful at the collegiate level and just in general. So um, I've seen a lot too with extended time on assignments. 
Um, we don't typically do extensions on assignments, but we do have a process and some students are approved for deadline extensions, but it needs to be very specific. And I usually have conversations with students about that, particularly when anxiety, ADHD, attentional issues are on the table. Um, how does extending the deadline help you when ultimately we're working towards that final day where everything has to be done? It may not be in the student's best interest to kind of assist them in getting in trouble. So, so I have a follow-up question and it may be redundant. You may have already answered it um, based on the tutoring question, but if you have a student who maybe needs help with um, organizing a long-term project and figuring out when they need to have what done by when, are there services for that? Yeah, so um, I work with a lot of my students. So if they've expressed a need for some sort of executive functioning, planning, time management, organization. I always invite them that I'm always more than willing to have them come in. And I do follow up appointments with my students, like 30 minute appointments. Some students wanna see you every week. Some students it's kind of more piecemeal, um, but I'm always willing to work with a student in that way. Um, we might also connect them, particularly if it's like a writing assignment, our writing center is really good about every part of the writing process. And that includes like a, a student can just go in with, this is the prompt and I don't understand it. And just sitting down with a writing center tutor for an hour long appointment one week to kind of clarify what the prompt is, um, start to generate some ideas and then they can come back for another appointment. So I think sometimes it's just trying to get students to really be more proactive and not wait until the last minute on those things. So, um, and that's, that's a challenge, right? Cause I'm, I'm a parent. And like I said, it's, I've been trying to say just a couple pages each night of, Amer of AP human or AP European history would really help us. So you don't look like you're crying in a couple weeks when you have like 20 pages to do the night before and a lot of other things. So it's just good executive functioning kind of practice with students right now or what are the strategies to learn that chunking and then seek out resources to help them with it. Pretty similar <laughs> at CCD. I think the, the biggest thing is that if a student knows they need help with something, it's, it's them having to ask. I mean, we do in the intake find out a lot of information, but there's a lot of uncovered information. Um, I think what I end up working with the most with uh, all students is time management skills. And I think I heard somebody talk about that. Um, I think it was you about the North Eastern um, College, we work with that also. We have some forms <laughs> that are um, paper and electronic to help students learn how to use their time wisely. And we've come up with some formulas. I think the Department of Education helped us with those to say that one credit hour is like three hours outside of class. And depending on your disability, you know, there could be more time. And how does that look? Do you have a job? Do you commute? Do you sleep extra long? Do you do any other sports or clean your house or whatever you do? Include it in there and try to help them plan their time. Um, maybe not taking a full schedule, you know, thinking about that. So I think I do the same thing as Melissa, as far as that goes, but I think for some reason it seems to be more in the time management area than anywhere else. So thank you. No one asked about parents in the process, and I guess we just <laughs> want to stress, I, I have a slide that I use when I do transition that's like, who, who has the roles? And, um, and they all have bullets, but I never pay attention to any of the things bulleted under each of my columns because it's more important the columns, which are the access center is responsible, right? We're, we're assisting in improving students for accommodations. We're helping to advocate if those accommodations, the students are having a hard time with the faculty member getting what they need. Um, the next person in that is the student. Um, at the college level, students are responsible for scheduling accommodated exams in advance. We have a three business day policy where you have to actually schedule all your exams three business days in advance. Now, if you were really on top of it, 
you can actually schedule that right off your syllabus dates at the beginning of a semester, get everything scheduled. That's what I tell students, get everything scheduled. And I even sit down and help them do that if they wanted to, so that we just have them and we don't have to think about them again um, and those kinds of things. But they're also responsible for letting us know if they need a note taker in a class. Uh, they're responsible, depending on different accommodations of actually doing some work to get that accommodation. So that's really important. And the other person that's responsible is the faculty member. Um, but I always point out like, I don't have a parent column. So, um, but all of our offices are fine with parents coming. We do informational appointments with prospective students that are looking at Metro and wanna bring in an IEP or just talk about what we might provide and parents can definitely come to that. Uh, we have a lot of parents that come to the first appointment with their um, soon to be college first year students. Um, we prefer if they come to that, um, that they let the student do all the talking. Um, but it is always very entertaining when the student's like, oh, I don't have any problems with that. And the mom is like, oh, don't get me started, right? And then it's like, <laughs> hey, you guys aren't matching. So let's, let's just explore that a little bit, right? Um, so parents can join us in that process, um, but without any sort of signed release, and our office has a release that students have to sign. Um, I have a parent who keeps contacting me right now about a student, and I've been very clear. She, um, I can't actually let her know the student is registered with our office, so I can just talk in these really general terms of like, I would encourage the student to sign a release if you feel like she's working with our office. It makes her really weird conversation when you've sat through a first appointment with parents and then they call like two days later and no release is signed and you have to have, pretend you don't know each other but that's what we do same does anyone else have any other questions because i see we're <laughs> at the two o'clock marker and i know you guys have a schedule about expectations that parents have as well because you might pay the bill but you don't have access to any grades or anything without your student signing releases with the institution that's called FERPA so that's another kind of thing is there's I used to do parenting college students when I worked at the University of Buffalo I do a presentation on that and one of them is just really being clear as a family and with parents between their parents and students on what the expectations are for college and performance and grades and information and those kinds of things as well. So, um, and if I could just one second, just to clarify, cause that's really important in the K-12 system as um, parents have the educational rights over the child through age 21 when they're in the public school system and of course, we know that once they leave public school and go to college, that ends. And so sometimes that's a really hard switch for them because they understand through IDEA that actually it's ECEA, that that educational rights is through age 21, as long as they're in the public school system. So it's kind of, that is a, an area that I think is hard for a lot of parents to fathom that, oh, I have no rights now that they're at college. So thank you for bringing that up. Great, well, I thank you all enough for joining us this afternoon. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that if anyone has questions,